Uh, my name is Pasquale Primiani. I'm the Application Field Manager for Sika based out of Edmonton. And I'm Kirsty Cameron, Technical Sales Representative, also out of Edmonton. And today we'll be demonstrating the mixing of Sika Grout 212. So a quick safety moment before you start mixing any product or using any equipment, just make sure you're always using the proper PPE and you familiarize yourself with the product data sheet and the safety data sheet for the safety of yourself, your crew, and your project. An engineered cementitious grout is a material that is packed, poured, or pumped into a void and hardens to create a bonded uniform bearing support and load transfer link between a structure or base plate and its foundation. These are generally used underneath statically loaded equipment that are not subjected independently to continuous vibrations. If continuous vibrations are involved, generally we'll move over to an epoxy grout. Today we'll just focus on cementitious grout and particularly the Sika Grout 212. So this can be used under a variety of base plates for supports for columns, beddings and machinery, anchor bolts, beams. There's a variety and a multitude of applications where it can be used. Today we're going to simulate Sika Grout 212 going underneath a base plate for a column. Uh, but as you, but as I mentioned, you'll you can use this in a variety of different applications and places. So Sika Grout 212 is an extremely versatile and extensively used material for these types of applications. This is a non-shrink cementitious grout. This means that unlike concrete, there are shrinking compensating mechanisms and additives that make the product slightly expand. When we say non-shrink, we mean slight expansion during our while in the plastic and hardened state. And the main purpose of this is when they're placing a column, when a contractor is placing a column or, or a structure, it allows for them to properly level, uh, orient, and elevate the plate to the specific requirements and then the grout is placed underneath the structure to support it. The benefit of the non-shrink component is that it'll always maintain intimate contact after cure and ensure that that transfer happens without any types of voids or gaps between the plate and its foundation through the grout. So being a non-shrink grout, it does mean that it does have to be confined during placement. Therefore, you shouldn't use the material in an unconfined repair mortar type application on an open slab, for example, without proper base plates or formwork. Seeker Grout 212 can be placed in a variety of methods and consistency. The water ratio can be adjusted depending on the placement method used. But as you'll see on the data sheet, and as we'll iterate a few times here, the maximum water that you can use for a 55 pound bag of grout is 4.6 liters. You never want to exceed that maximum amount of water. When we say it can be dry packed or go anywhere from dry packed to a flowable consistency, what that means is the material can be dry packed and it's mixed at a consistency where if you were to take a small amount of grout in a ball in a gloved hand and you tossed it lightly between the two hands, it wouldn't break apart, nor would it leave any cement paste on your gloves. This would then be taken and literally rammed underneath a base plate with a hammer and a rod until it was literally dry packed underneath a plate. The other option would be to form it and pour it, and then you'd have the consistency of a flowable grout which you can either pour it if you're doing a small volume like we'll be doing today out of a pail, or if you're doing large volumes, you can always have that global consistency and put it through pumps and pump at larger distances or for larger volumes. Details such as surface preparation, mixing, application, and curing instructions are found on the product data sheet. And it'll get into topics of surface preparation, for example, where the concrete must be mechanically prepared to the required concrete surface profiles. And if you've seen the I cry the International Concrete Repair Institute little rubber pads here. They show the concrete surface profiles ranging anywhere from one to a 10, one being a light pressure wash and 10 being an aggressive profile that has large amplitudes. Generally with grouts, you want to be in that range of six to a 10 where all the concrete is mechanically prepared. You've removed all the latents. You've removed all curing compounds. You've also removed any, um, any prohibiting materials or debris that are on the concrete surface that would prohibit bond. So it needs to be roughened to the extent that there's no smooth surfaces. You do want to have some lightly exposed aggregates that are slightly fractured, but making sure the surface is, is um, well bonded and clean. Uh, the concrete also needs to have a surface saturated dry surface. So generally referred to as an SSD surface, in which case the concrete, once saturated, no longer absorbs water, but there's no freestanding water on the surface when you're applying grout. And this is critical for the placement because if you were to go onto a dry concrete surface and pour grout, the dry surface of the concrete can actually draw moisture out of the grout. 
uh, and that can introduce other problems. It can reduce maybe some flowability depending on the amplitude of your concrete, or it can maybe even prematurely dry the, the grout if it's drawing water from the substrate itself. So all substrate surfaces need to be SSD. And when we define SSD, if the concrete's less than 28 days, generally needs about a 12 hour uh, surface saturation. If it's older than 28 days, you'd want to surface saturate it for about 24 hours. Steel surfaces also need to be properly cleaned, free from rust, oils, debris, or any kind of prohibiting um, residuals left on the steel it needs to be cleaned. All your materials should be pre-prepared and, uh, and you should be doing the preliminary work ahead of time so that all you're doing when you're ready to mix is pour the grout into place. So ensuring your formwork is properly sealed and secured, and that can be as simple as running a bead of Sika Flex 1A underneath your, your formwork to seal it off. It also, your formwork can depend on how it's installed, depending on how you're installing uh, the grout on a project and how far you need the flow. If you need to have open forms where you have elevated forms, pardon me, where you're pouring in from one side and flowing through to the other. But you always do need to have a plan in place. So your contractors should always familiarize themselves with how they will be pouring the material to ensure they're not trapping any air. So if you have a base blade, for example, like we're going to demonstrate today, your formwork is open on the other side and you're pushing air and material through to the other side and releasing all the air. If you're in a larger base plate scenario, you always want to make sure there's proper vent holes so that you can always release the air and you're not trapping it by pouring from two sides. For best results, you always want to precondition the product to 18 to 29 degrees C. Uh, lower temperatures can result in slower strength development. It can be applied at lower temperatures uh, as per the data sheet. Uh, generally, you want to maintain your ambient temperatures no, no less than 5 degrees C and upwards of 32 degrees C. Those are your kind of ranges you want to work within. But uh, your material should always be preconditioned. So even if you're going into a cooler environment, preconditioning the material gives you better performance and installation. You always want to pre-measure the amount of water. Never exceed, as I mentioned earlier, the specification of 4.6 liters of water for a 55-pound bag. You can always reduce a bit of your water below that if you need to, depending on how far you're flowing um, and, and what your placement requires. The size of the mixture also needs to be appropriate for the amount of grout that you're mixing. So today we're mixing one bag. We'll have it in a small pail, in a five-gallon pail. If you're doing larger volumes, your contractor is doing larger volumes, they can have mortar mixers. They can pre-measure their water for maybe bulk, uh, bulk mixing and have uh, more water in there, but that's determined based on the quantity that you, of growth that you need. Always ensure you're using potable water, clean pails, clean mixers. You don't want to contaminate your growth before you've had a chance to install it. Mix using a low-speed drill, somewhere in the range of 300 to 450 RPMs. Uh, make sure all your water is always pre-added to your mixer, your mixing vessel. And then your dry powder is added into that and mixed for three minutes. It's always a good idea to stop halfway through if you're doing a pail mix and just take a margin trowel and scrub the side of the pails just to make sure that any dry powder that's built up on the side is well integrated. The Seeker Grow 212 can always be used up to six inches neat. Or if deeper applications are involved, where you're going, say, from six inches up to 10 to 12 inches, you can add aggregate to it. And you'll notice on the product data sheet in the mixing section, we will describe a, an area where we'll say you can add up to 12 kgs of 10 millimeter coarse aggregate that meets certain requirements uh, and is clean, properly graded, surface saturated as well. So you want to have your aggregate pre-saturated if you're extending the grout in that 6 to 12 inch range of, of application. You also want to make sure that it complies with the proper standards of the, the aggregate itself. So ASTM C33, for example. Uh, extending it with aggregate may reduce some compressive strengths. Uh, and flexual strengths, that's anticipated generally on sites. Uh, but if they do need to test it, they can always test the aggregate that they're going to mix on site for their own uh, their own purposes of knowing what they're going to be installing. The prepared grout can be then pumped or transported. Once mixed, can be then pumped or transported in the pump or in pails. Uh, if once installed, if you need to, you can externally vibrate the forms. Um, but without further ado, we'll mix up some grout and uh, we'll show you how it looks. We'll just straight down the side of the pail just to make sure if anything's built up around the sides, gets well integrated into the mix. Keep mixing for the full three nuts. Nice gear of material. 
And here we've also simulated a pour box. So we're gonna create some head pressure so that we can push the material in and through underneath the plate, depending on how far you gotta travel. Uh, header boxes are good just to keep some weight and pressure on the material. You can see the air traveling from one side of the plate to the other as the material fills the void. So it's a, and fills that whole void underneath the whole plate. All the air is getting pushed out to the side. If you need to, as mentioned, you can vibrate your forms if you have to. Any excess material that comes out, you can always pour back into your header box just to keep that pressure up. And once you see the material come out the side, if you want to come to this side with the camera here, you can see the material filling the whole underside of the plate. You'll see it fills it up. Generally, if they're doing a steel frame or something like that, or a steel member, they're going to also tuck tape and or duct tape the sides of the actual plate just so then you can peel off the tape, protect the top of your steel, and just keep the, uh, the plate itself nice and clean. And then they'll have properly installed grout underneath their, uh, their equipment. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the flowability and, and the mixing procedure for the Seed Grout 212. And then uh, after the material is set, strip forms are normally stripped, and then you can shave off if you have to, depending on the project or what the spec calls for. You can shave off and uh, form the edges, depending if you need to chamfer them 45 degrees, for example. Uh, that can be done after material is set. Uh, this is a cementitious material, so just bear in mind that curing is required. So after placement and finishing has been done, you do want to take something like the Sika Floor Seal Water Base 18 or 25 and, uh, and apply it to it. You can also use burlap, wet burlap for curing. There's a couple different options for curing purposes, but the Sika Floor Seal Water Base 18 is just nice because you can apply it, you can brush it, you can roll it, apply it to the surface, and then you're kind of one and done. You can leave it, and that helps to retain the moisture in the material so that it can cure properly. Uh, you do want to maintain the wet ambient and substrate temperatures uh, between that 5 to 32, wherever you had them during uh, mixing and placing, you want to keep that temperature uh, for at least 72 hours uh, after placing, just to make sure that you give it enough time to uh, to get to strength uh, before, say, releasing it to any frost or, or colder conditions. There is also the option of you adding one bottle of Sikasem Accelerator with the Sika Grout 212 without affecting the workability of the Sika Grout 212. You'll find that information on the product data sheet for the Sikasem Accelerator itself or on the Sika Grout 212 data sheet. There's a little segment in our technical bulletin that kind of shows you the strength development at different temperatures and at different days once you add one, once you add one bottle of Sika Sem Accelerator. Uh, one important note to add if you are adding the Sika Sem Accelerator is make sure that that accounts for the full volume of water that you're using. So if you're adding the 150 milliliters of the Sika Sem Accelerator, make sure you reduce your water by 150 milliliters of water. So you're not overwatering it past that 4.6 limitation of the grout. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of mixing Seeker Grout 212s, gives you a bit of a demonstration to see the flowability of the material. Uh, as always, Seeka is around to provide any kind of technical support or additional references or information we can. So please feel free to reach out to your local technical sales representative, and we'd be happy to help you with all your projects and selling the project along. Thank you very much for having us. Have yourself a great day.